really important juncture for the education profession uh, and the trade union movement uh, in general. Um, because, of course, this weekend we expect announcements uh, from Boris Johnson and the Conservatives uh, about how they plan to ease the lockdown uh, and potentially to change uh, the, the situation for schools in England. Um, our speakers are going to talk to you uh, this evening about um, how the crisis unfolded in our schools, um, what they did about it, and also to talk us through what needs to now happen uh, to ensure that uh, students, uh, our wider school communities and education workers uh, are kept safe. And I think it's it's not an over exaggeration to say that actually the action by education workers all over the world, um, organising, unifying around specific demands uh, to keep people safe, has actually saved lives. And the action by uh, many of the people on this call this evening uh, will have saved the lives uh, of. Uh, of, of people uh, across the country and across the world. Um, and I think that's a really important thing for us to remember um, because of course, what is driving uh, the conservatives and their friends in big business as they clamor uh, to open up uh, schools and, uh, and other parts of the economy uh, is their interest in profits and the economy itself rather than uh, placing uh, health and safety uh, at the forefront. And so it's our role uh, as trade unionists, uh, as socialists, uh, and in our communities uh, to organise to ensure uh, that, that health and safety is put first. So this evening, we're really privileged to be uh, joined by a fantastic panel uh, of speakers. We're going to hear uh, in a moment from Carly Slingby and Sarah Byrne from Hackney uh, NEU, um, who are going to talk to us about how they've organised uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Matt Malley from the other side of the Atlantic, uh, from Seattle. Um, he's uh, a, a teacher in Seattle, also a socialist alternative member, and is going to be giving us an update on the situation uh, in the US. Um, we're also joined by Michael Barker, who is a teaching assistant and unison rep in Leicester, uh, to talk us through um, the situation in his workplace. And our final uh, speaker for the introductions uh, is Max Toynbee, who is a NEU rep in Lambus in South London. Now, um, it's really important that this evening is not just about panel speakers, it's an interactive uh, forum as well. And we hope that people out there uh, are thinking about questions they would like the speakers uh, to answer. So if you've got a question, then please uh, put it into the chat. Uh, so that it can be passed on to me as the moderator and I can direct it uh, to our speakers. So we're going to get things underway now. Um, and we're going to hear, first of all, uh, from Sarah and Carly, who are both uh, National Education Union reps in Hackney. Um, and Carly and Sarah, if you could just uh, start us off by telling us a little bit of background of how the crisis unfolded uh, in your workplaces and what you did as NEU reps to ensure uh, that your members and your school community uh, was kept safe. Uh, I think we're beginning with um, Sarah. So, Sarah, uh, if you can hi, just hi, give us a little flavour. Hi, I'm really, really, um, really pr proud to be able to come and, and speak here today. And um, I hope I'm not too rambly because it is, this is kind of quite new for me. But um, I became a health and safety rep over around a year ago, but really didn't have very much uh, of an impact within the school. But what was important, I think, was that... Um, when Johnson announced his herd immunity and, and you know, that many of our loved ones were going to die, these kind of alarm bells really started to ring in school. And so um, in the school itself, we had quite a big NUT group, an NEU group, sorry, that had been established over, I think, 20 years. Um, and we've got something like 60 members. So we called a union meeting straight away. And, and really the first thing is to establish what people, how people felt about it, what kind of concerns were coming out um, of the members. And we could immediately then go back to management with a list of, of, of demands. And obviously the, the most important thing in terms of health and safety for us was that anybody who, who was at risk of the virus or more at risk of the virus will be um, most protected. So pregnant members of staff, people with underlying health conditions, people who lived with people with underlying health conditions, we managed to establish really quickly that they, they could uh, work from home in the first instance. So I think in the week leading to the shutdown, we had meetings, we were in constant liaison with management like on a daily basis and seeking any advice from the national and from, and from local as well. Um, 
and within three days we'd managed to to pull the school down to a complete a complete shutdown from the first meeting so we were really happy actually that we managed to get everybody safely out of the building as quickly as possible and um, in terms of the provision then for kids obviously people were really concerned that the kids would be sent to this uh, vulnerable kids especially being sent home to very difficult circumstances and so the school managed to um to get it so that food was delivered food parcels were delivered but that was all done on a volunteer basis so no member of staff was asked to come in um, unless they volunteered we established that people could only come to work if they were volunteering by by walking or cycling so no public transport use so we really tried to think of minimizing the impact of the virus being spread or transmitted not just within the school but within the community wider and and i think i think to to the credit of the management they were really cooperative in in, in orchestrating that so we ended up with a very, very quick, very uh, successful shutdown. Um, now, going going forward from that, then we've we've had um, in school we've had a weekly Zoom meeting with the NEU members, which has been brilliant. The initial thing was thinking that people might feel quite isolated on their own. So we we had we have a weekly Zoom at eleven o'clock on a Tuesday. The initial thing was just checking in, and out of the out of the follow up meetings, then we established what people's real worries were. Was it workload? Was it their own health um, at home? Was it mental health? Was it um, you know the the worries about going back? And so we managed to put together a survey, a survey monkey, which had a really good response. And through doing that, we could really go back to management and say, look, this you're asking us to do this. This is not reasonable. This is fine. People are happy with this. So things like whether you use your own phone to phone pupils and this kind of thing. Um, and throughout the whole the, throughout the whole process, I think we've really tried to make everybody feel that they communicated together. So the group has really been established together, and it's been much stronger now. We've managed to recruit four new members to the NEU in school, um, and we've got other people now asking if they can be supporting the health and safety rep role in school, which is great. Um, on a wider front, the Hackney at local NEU has been just brilliant. We have regular meetings and the national, I managed to um, they've set up these amazing Zoom training because I didn't have any training so far. So a two day training by Zoom to make sure that we really know the, the law in terms of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And because they were so proactive and because the training was such good quality, that means that we could disseminate all that information to other schools and other, other teachers, other reps in other schools who are maybe not quite so confident. I think the final thing that um, we've really taken advantage of was the petition from the NEU. They had an online petition which was like, don't open schools till it's safe. And we we didn't just use it with our members. We took the initiative to like try and go to pa go out to parents. So do we know parents are their friends? Um, I live on an estate. We put it on a WhatsApp group on the estate. All the parents on the estate signed it. So we've managed to try and get some kind of momentum around the notion that, you know, we've established this safe ground now. We've saved lives, we think so. We agree with what James said. It's about not making sure that nothing, nothing is uh, is gone back to as normal until it's perfectly safe to do so. Um, and I suppose I'll leave it there. We're looking at the five tests that the NEU's published, which are great. Thanks very much, uh, Sarah. I think that's a really good insight into um, into you know the life of uh, the trade union rep uh, during the COVID crisis and how people have really stepped up um, in this particular situation. Carly uh, is also from uh, from Hackney, but works in a different school um, and can maybe give us a little bit of an insight uh, into what's going on uh, in her workplace uh, and how she's been developing that uh, as a trade union rep there. So Carly Slingsby from Hackney in the year. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, very similar to Sarah's experiences, when we realised that all of this was starting and that it was very likely that schools would be closing down, we immediately got our reps group together, uh, sorry, our union members together in school. And we spoke about how we wanted to negotiate with management and everyone contributed to negotiating points, which included making sure our agency staff continued to get paid, making sure that we had a plan for how our children were going to get, our vulnerable children were going to get fed from um from from us not sorry from, from when we leave and us not being there how was that going to operate what was it going to look like um and management luckily were very successful to that and agreed to all of our negotiating points the only confliction conflicting matter was the rotor so there were way too many staff on our rotor so we went back to our union members drew, drew up some more negotiating points went back to management went back with some data on how it's affecting 
um, how this virus is affecting people in, in large groups who aren't socially distancing. And they managed to whittle our rotor down to people who can only cycle, um, walk or drive. So anyone who was getting public transport was told they did not have to be on that rotor. Um, since then, we've set up our WhatsApp group and we stay in constant contact via the WhatsApp group. And um, that's really helpful for us who aren't on that road to know what's happening in schools and to keep in touch with some of our management who are on there to see how the day-to-day -day running is going, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of risk assessments, PPE, how they are handling the children, which children are coming in, who needs extra support at home for us teachers to be able to get in contact with those parents and help out um, in that respect. Um, and also, as a Hackney officer, we've been organising a lot with our reps, making sure we're doing Zoom calls with them once a week, checking out what's happening in their schools, how their heads are responding, um, making sure that their workload isn't too great, making sure that their, men looking at their mental health is being looked after, um, as well as their physical health. And the union has been extremely helpful in terms of sending out advice. So with our reps WhatsApp group, Anyone who's got any questions, we're able to answer them very quickly from the advice that's coming out from Kevin and Mary's emails and the general advice on the union website. Um, and I know that everyone's really, the petition has been signed by about 350,000 members, not just the public, but teachers and heads alike. And 10,000 head teachers have signed this petition to not open schools unless it's safe to do so. And I know this is really helping reps um, with keeping momentum going in their groups of encouraging people to uh, keep going and encouraging, not encouraging, but in letting them know that our union has their best interests at heart. We do not want that school, that these schools to open until everyone feels safe to return. So they need to follow these five steps. So that's our next Next big thing is making sure these five steps are pushed. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much to Carly and to Sarah. I think that's a really good introduction uh, to what's happening and kind of sets up a few uh, a few different topics that we can think about when we come to the Q and A. Um, but we're going to go from Hackney now to Seattle, um, and uh, we're going to hear from Matt Malley in a moment. Um, who is a teacher in Seattle. Um, and before we bring Matt in, I think it's worth us remembering that the last couple of years uh, across the United States of America, uh, we've seen a wave of industrial action uh, with education workers um, uh, fighting and winning significant victories over funding, over pay, uh, over issues uh, around assessment uh, and so on. And uh, so I think it's really important for us to hear uh, not just about uh, the immediate issues uh, in COVID-19, but how that links in uh, to uh, some of those uh, struggles that are going on uh, in the United States of America. So we're really pleased to have uh, Matt here with us, that he can join us. Um, so Matt, if you could just give us, so you were nodding uh, to a, a few of the comments that have already been made. It'd be good to hear about some of those similarities and parallels, but also maybe uh, some of the differences as, uh, as well. Uh, Matt, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, and actually, so I wanted to start introducing myself. My name, uh, as James said, is Matt Maley. Uh, I've worked in Seattle Public Schools, and I've been a member of the Seattle Education Association for about a decade now. Um, as you can see, I'm also a member of Socialist Alternative USA, uh, and I'm in grad school for a master's in special ed, um, although I've mostly taught math and music in my time. Um, thanks again to the organizers. Thanks for everyone on the call uh, who's taking time out of their Friday uh, to be to be part of this. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the situation on the ground in the USA in just one second here. Um, but ultimately, the question I see being posed uh, for all of us, for educators and non-educators uh, is in the US, in the UK, uh, and, and elsewhere, uh, who decides when to reopen? Right. For me, as a socialist, as a unionist, uh, it's a question of who is in the position of strength uh, to determine when and how to safely reopen schools. Is it in the hands of school workers uh, or is it in the hands uh, of school workers who know uh, what safe learning and working conditions look like? Uh, or is it in the hands of bosses in the right wing to reopen the economy uh, on the basis of the profit? So uh, as of a few days ago, 50 uh, out of the 50 states, 42 uh, have mandated 
school closures through the end of this school year. Another four states have recommended but not mandated closures. Uh, a lot of that was due to worker and educator organizing. In New York City, the epicenter of the crisis in the US, uh, there have been dozens of cases uh, and deaths, uh, especially paraeducators and uh, people of color working, working in the schools who are most impacted. Um, despite this, state economies are talking about reopening, have started reopening these past few weeks, uh, which could have untold impacts on a second peak in the crisis in the US, uh, as well as on schooling uh, even into next year. So all over uh, the United States, students uh, face lack of access to stable internet connections, to computers, uh, to printers, all of which is required for distance learning, uh, especially with public libraries being closed. So paraprofessionals and other support staff uh, also don't have district issued laptops so they can work remotely. Um, they face the same challenges. Substitutes, mostly retired and older, um, are working without alternative sources of income. And as we've already heard, a little bit on this call um, where people are being expected to work without uh, proper protective uh, equipment and the list goes on. So it's a lot of the same uh, challenges to what James was saying. Um, I think the it's important to take a step back. Hopefully people can bring up questions about the lessons from the past few years uh, of labor struggles in the US, um, but that's not uh, what I'm gonna touch on right now, but I'd love to get into that later if there's time. Um, in Seattle specifically, all students will earn uh, top marks in A, uh, except for a few uh, specific exceptions. Uh, and while this is a concern, a top concern for a small layer of parents, many families are facing far more immediate concerns. Uh, again, as was mentioned, access to uh, food, which, which students often require uh, or heavily rely on the school system to provide. Uh, likewise, with access to health services, uh, especially mental health services. Um, in the US, without uh, a Medicare for all system, or universal health care, or in your case, without a fully funded NHS, uh, what is the solution to schools being closed and students uh, w with, without access to mental health services? So this leads me really quickly uh, in the last minute or so that I have. Uh, one of the big problems that we're facing in the US as educators uh, is actually the opposite problem that is being faced in the UK, uh, where instead of being, uh, being pushed to reopen schools before it's safe, uh, states are using this opportunity to permanently shutter schools, uh, which, is, which is shameful. Uh, this is this goes for uh, higher education universities in Vermont are facing this um, public schools secondary schools primary schools um, grade schools in California are being closed um, and that raises the larger question which definitely ties into uh, the labor movement um, getting reactivated and, and uh, moving into struggle uh, against privatization. One of the ways that looks in, in the US is uh, charter school co-location where half of a school or part of a school um, becomes converted into a charter school. Uh, and oftentimes that ends in the whole school eventually becoming a charter school, uh, which is a distinctly anti-union, uh, totally uh, privatization uh, process. So across the country, as I mentioned, uh, budgets are being slashed under the name uh, uh, of projected deficits um, under, the, under the premise of austerity measures being the solution. When we, of course, as socialists, uh, as trade unionists, know that austerity closures, these are not the solutions. Uh, the solution is organized working class movements to permanently fund schools uh, by making the rich pay. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, opening them in a safe manner. Um, this is particularly important uh, in the context that we're about to, we could potentially enter the largest economic collapse uh, that many of us have seen in our lifetimes, uh, even as me, somebody who entered the workforce around the Great Recession uh, in 2008. Um, it's important to note that although COVID triggered this crisis to a large degree, the contradictions that existed from beforehand uh, were, the, were the causes. COVID did not cause this economic collapse. Um, the, uh, the underlying contradictions of capitalism uh, existed well before the outbreak of this crisis. Uh, and so last, I'll just end on this. Um, the, ultimately, the crisis has uncovered this. It has laid bare the rotten foundations. So it's not enough to meet this crisis uh, with middling solutions or uh, half-baked uh, plans to reopen the economy. Um, we need socialist solutions and planning uh, to meet this crisis. Things like high quality, publicly uh, owned social housing, uh, steeply affordable, 
things like universal health care, things like high speed internet uh, as a public utility, winning these victories is, while well, on one hand, ultimately what is necessary, it also will develop a movement uh, that has the strength, uh, the ability to, to uh, choose when to reopen the economy. Uh, that is, it is working people, not the bosses, who know uh, what would be dis um, required to re return to school safely, and therefore it should be in our, our hands to decide uh, when and how to go back to school. So thanks again uh, for having me on this call. Uh, I'm really proud to be here standing alongside all of these uh, activists and educators in the UK, uh, and I look forward to the rest of it. Thanks. Thanks very much, Matt. It was a really, really, uh, a really good uh, summary of what's going on in the US, but raising uh, some really important points for us to consider about how we can broaden uh, out our, our analysis and our demands. And we're going to come back to that in the uh, discussion a little bit later on uh, to talk it through. Um, but we've got a couple more speakers before we get to the Q and A. Um, I'm going to bring uh, in next uh, Michael Barker, uh, who is uh, in Leicester in the Midlands in the UK um, and uh, is also a uh, Unison rep um, and you may have seen today that uh, all of the uh, TUC uh, unions, uh, education unions that represent education workers produced a joint statement and list of demands uh, to place on the government uh, around school closing uh, and that kind of united, uh, that united front of the education unions is going to be incredibly important going forward. So we're really, really uh, pleased that we don't just have any EU uh, members on this call, uh, but we also have uh, our our comrades from Unison as well. And it's uh, it's really important that we hear uh, from, uh, uh, from those comrades uh, to discuss uh, the way forward. So Michael, if you could give us a bit of a background on what's happened in your workplace, uh, maybe more um, more broadly across uh, across the UK in terms of the action Unison have taken uh, in education. Michael. Hello. Yeah, I mean, I work at a sixth form college in Leicester. Uh, like you said, I'm Unison rep, uh, but my college is closed at the moment. Uh, I mean, so much has happened just recently. I think uh, just in the week before the lockdown, the, the National Education Union was on strike in my workplace and across the entire country uh, for six, all six forms were on strike. Uh, and I went and supported that strike. I, I didn't go into work that day. And one of the reasons why that strike was taking place is because over the last 10 years now, we've had a 22% funding cut for six form college sector in this country. And so already when this pandemic hit, education was in crisis. We'd just gone through a big restructure last year. Uh, must, I've even had a cut in my pay recently. So there's an awful lot happening. So I think it was really good for even on that strike the day, uh, the week before the uh, the full lockdown happened. Uh, it, there was a joint rally organised with the university as well, because you know, our local university was on strike for similar reasons, really, because of attacks and austerity. So, I mean, this is the context of it all. I mean, I'll talk a little bit about in the run up to the uh, the full lockdown. Because uh, it was all their herd immunity stuff that really got people scared, I think. I mean, even in that week before we closed down, we had support workers in work who were vulnerable, but coming into work because there's this uh, like a, a presenteeism in workplaces where people feel they have to come in because it's for the students. And these are like front facing workers who are very vulnerable and potentially could have died if they got uh, coronavirus. And so there wasn't really enough being done. So as a union rep, uh, work with members to put pressure on management to make sure our members were looked after. So we made sure that we sent home workers who were vulnerable and sometimes that took some persuading. Um, and I think one of the things you mentioned, James, is that uh, just today there's been a, a joint statement put out by the six education unions, which I think is a really good step because that hadn't happened in the past. I think midway through April, Unison put out a joint statement with uh, some of the other support side unions. But this is uh, bringing everyone together to show to the government that we're not going back to school until you negotiate with us properly. And the unions want a full say in whether the workplace is safe and it's workers who are going to determine whether we come back to work or not. And I think like the government has been absolutely useless on every aspect to this, so they can't be trusted, which is why workers have to be at the forefront of making the decisions and unions. Uh, I think 
even in that week before we closed down, the students didn't really understand. I mean, we're talking post 16 year olds. They didn't really understand what social distancing was. There was so like the mixed messages from the government made it so that nobody knew what was really going on. Nobody really understood even who was vulnerable. So like it took going around speaking to people, reassuring them to get things sorted out in my own workplace. I think also one of the things in my workplace, we've had because uh, of savings and cost cutting and stuff, we have the contract subcontracted work as cleaners and caterers aren't directly employed by our workplace. So one of the things I talked to them and they were quite worried about their future getting like potentially being told they were going to have to work in other cities if they wanted to continue being paid and they didn't have access to cars and they can't travel very easily on very low pay. So I made sure that uh, our management got directly in contact with those subcontractors to say to them, like, if you don't make sure those workers get full pay during any period of closure, then uh, we probably won't be using you again in the future. And so I did get that assurance. And unfortunately, I found out since then that uh, some of those workers, well, the cleaners are only getting 80% of their pay. And like myself, I'm not at work at the moment, I'm on 100% of the pay. And I believe all workers should get 100% of the pay during this crisis, whether they're in work or not, because the pandemic isn't our fault and we have to pay our bills still. And so life has to carry on. In fact, it's harder for a lot of workers and people who are furloughed at the moment. So that's something we're going to have to like try and sort out going forward. Uh, yeah, like again, like with other workplaces, by putting pressure on our own management, we were able to get to our own management to say they were going to close prior to the government saying they were going to close. So hopefully that put a bit of extra pressure on the government to take that step and close down all the uh, education sector. And I've also been working with the local trades council, so the other trade unions, to put out like we put out an anti-racist statement like making making very clear that the reasons for the crisis, the reasons why more people are dying now than need to be is because of the continuous attacks on the health service, on all services in this country. And so they're to blame for it and workers shouldn't play, pay to uh, have the blame. And as a member of uh, Leicester Socialist Alternative, we helped uh, launch a campaign with the Bakers Union to uh, make sure that workers uh, like in the region, but I mean, this is much as we could do, they were getting full pay during the crisis as well because you have low paid key workers at the moment uh, are being furloughed or being forced onto statutory sick pay where they get 95 pound a week and so we're supporting campaigns writing articles helping do sort of leaflets which are circulated in factories which try to fight for their rights and agitate uh, so that uh, they get full pay uh, and finally i'll just say that uh, well Two things is like next week uh, we're having our first branch meeting online by Skype for uh, Unison in Leicester and uh, I'm put forward a motion there where we're, I'm going to be asking the branch to support the idea that the union, the union branch supports full sick pay for all workers across the whole of our three and a half thousand members in Leicester. I think it might even be more than that now because what we're finding is um, there was a newspaper article just from the other week uh, in Leicestershire, it's a conservative area, but uh, there's care workers who are having their pay cut during this crisis, care workers in care homes. And so the worst affected are losing a third of their pay. So our union, Leicester City Unison, has to show full solidarity with workers across the city and across the region, across the country, and help coordinate uh, actions between the unions so that nobody loses out of this crisis and we all come out of it and as many people as alive the better. Thanks very much, Michael. That was a really, really uh, great introduction. And clearly there's a lot going on, uh, not just in your workplace, but I think uh, talking uh, about some of the, the links that you've made uh, across the trade union movement in the community is really important. And looking at some of the comments coming in from the chat, um, then there's there's a lot that we can uh, discuss. And of course, keep, keep commenting, keep posting questions. Uh, it's fantastic to hear uh, that we've got Hackney NEU members uh, on uh, Facebook Live watching, uh, Sarah and Carly and others, uh, which is really good to hear. Um, but we're going to go uh, the other side of the river now uh, to Lambeth, and we've got Max Toynbee, who is uh, an NEU rep and a member of Socialist Alternative. And Max, if you could give us a bit of a picture, we've talked a lot about what's happened during the crisis. We're coming to quite a critical moment now where 
um, where the government could, we, we don't know uh, what they're going to announce on Sunday, but it could be that they uh, announce a phased reopening uh, of schools. And it's really important that as uh, across the trade union movement, across the education profession, uh, we we know what what we uh, deem to be um, safe uh, for us to be able to go back in to work, as Matt talked about in his contribution, um, but also to maybe talk about uh, some of the other issues that we're going to have to do with uh, as schools reopen fully uh, to our students. So Max Toynbee from Lambeth NEU, uh, over to you. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, and it's been inspiring to hear from the other people on the call. Uh, I've only been a co-rep at my school since September. So hearing about the other stories and experiences is uh, really useful and really inspiring. Um, so schools closed on the 20th of March, a week after most of the European countries, many of which had lower rates of cases and deaths than us. Uh, the UK now has had over 30,000 deaths, the highest number in Europe. And for the past week or more, there have been an average of around 5,000 new cases each day. So this is clearly not the time to be reopening schools. In fact, uh, another teachers union, the NASUWT, has announced that schools shouldn't open until September. So the other speakers have already demonstrated the need for workers to organise in unions. We can't rely on the Tory government to protect our interest and the interest of the wider community. In my own school, we had three union meetings in the week leading up to the closure, which was uh, double what we'd already had in the year before that, which raised the need for things like protective measures for the staff that were going to be coming into school, um, uh, as well as, I think, as uh, Sarah or Carly mentioned, having a voluntary rotor, sort of reflecting uh, Michael's point, there's a strong sort of cultural presenteeism in our school. We wanted to make sure that no members of staff, particularly those who are vulnerable, felt compelled to come in and, and risk their health. And um, also, it's no coincidence that just one day after the NEU leadership called for schools to close, the government followed suit. So it just shows the importance and the power of, uh, of organised workers. However, as has been mentioned, schools have remained open to vulnerable children and the children of key workers. And educators have been working hard at home, providing resources, teaching and communicating with uh, students. And now the NEU, as has been mentioned already, has put forward these five tests to be met before schools can reopen more widely. Um, and this has been pushed further, as James has mentioned, by the TUC's principles and tests uh, announced today, which I'll speak about a little bit later. So the NEU's five tests are quite vague. The, the, the trouble with them is that, while they're good, they're not very specific. So I think the leadership should make them a bit more clear. To give one example, test one, much lower numbers of COVID-19 cases, is a really good test. We need to set a number for this, though. Uh, and again, would this be a specific number of new daily cases or a specific transmission rate over a particular period of time? You know, like Matt said, who decides when to reopen? Well, we should decide these sorts of criteria as the workers on the ground. Um, the NEU five tests, as well as the TUC principles, have been formed through pressure from members. A number of the speakers tonight have mentioned the NEU petition online, which I think has reached certainly over 350,000, uh, I think higher than that now. Um, in my district and others, we organised an open letter uh, to the local authority demanding that schools were only reopened when it's safe to do so. And that was really important in organising within school groups, like with my co-rep and others, to get a majority of members to sign the letter. Uh, and that sort of galvanised membership and reps, building on the more than 5,000 members who've joined the NEU since the beginning of the crisis, as well as 300 people who've stepped up as reps. Um, so our union membership is increasing, members' involvement and understanding of the role of the union is increasing too. So as James said, what next? You know, uh, well, we definitely need effective reps like the ones that are on the call tonight in every school. And reps right now, as well as individual members, need to be backed up by national action. For example, there's been some discussion uh, in lots of different unions and uh, lots of different areas in the NEU um, about the use of what's called Section 44 of the Employment Rights Act. So this is a law that provides employees with the right to refuse to return to a workplace that they deem to be unsafe. And there are examples of where Section 44 was used successfully to close schools before the government's delayed response back in March. Uh, and this law could be used again to prevent schools reopening before it's safe. The trouble is that it only applies to individual employees, not to collective decisions made by a union group. But, uh, but nevertheless, a group of workers, let's say in a union group, is made up of individual employees who could each deem their workplace to be unsafe and therefore use the law to stay away. 
And the key issue here is not only the work of reps in schools raising awareness of things like Section 44, but also that reps and members are concretely backed up by the union nationally. So we'd be confident that if we take this sort of action, um, that we'll, we'll be protected from any potential recriminations. Now, another thing I want to talk about is in contrast to how the mainstream media has ignored the health and safety of education workers. There have been some terrible headlines recently. Workers have actually understood the need to support each other. Um, lots of NEU members were involved in the educators for carers hashtag. And likewise, thousands of NHS workers signed an open letter to the health secretary, Matt Hancock, pointing out the deaths of teachers and the need to protect them. And that's why it's really good, uh, as has already been mentioned, that today the TUC sent a joint statement from uh, unions involved in teaching, including the GMB, the Head Teachers Union, NASUWT, our own union, Unison and Unite, setting out principles for, uh, and tests for the reopening of schools. But I think we still need to consider some questions about what this actually means for rank and file trade unionists. For example, how do we ensure that this proposed national COVID-19 education task force, which is supposed to involve the unions, how can we ensure that that is reflected at a local level? Um, you know, um, should we set up local committees of union reps and heads that can agree together on how to implement any national strategy? Uh, the TUC principles also talk about governing bodies and school leadership deciding when to close a school in the event uh, of an outbreak with consultation with the unions. But actually, how can we ensure that educators are genuinely in control of the decision of whether to close a school in the event of a COVID-19 outbreak locally? Of course, the most powerful tool that we have at our disposal as organised workers is collective industrial action. That's why, as well as the use of Section 44, we should have a ballot for industrial action in order to make sure that any school reopening protects members and we have that tool there ready to use it if we need to. And what about after COVID-19? Hopefully this will come out in the discussion later. Um, there are likely to be attempts by the government and school managers to use the experience of this crisis to kind of do education on the cheap, um, perhaps by deprofessionalizing and de-skilling the use of online learning. But on the flip side to that, the cancellation of exams and the cancellation of league tables for a year has given us a glimpse of what an alternative education system could look like. So hopefully there'll be some questions and discussion about that later. Overall, of course, the trouble, um, as was touched on by Matt before, uh, is that our capitalist society really wasn't prepared for COVID-19. You know, we talk about individual people who are in a vulnerable group that are vulnerable to the virus, but capitalism is an entire system that makes everyone vulnerable. And unlike individuals who can't choose whether or not their own bodies are vulnerable, we can choose whether we have a society that is vulnerable to such crises. It's decisions made by the ruling class that lead to poverty, overcrowded housing, an underfunded NHS, and keeping open or possibly reopening schools, uh, which have contributed and could contribute to this crisis. Our society will always be susceptible to the ravages of pandemics like this, as long as the profits of the few are valued more than the health of the many. So what we need is a democratic socialist plan in the future to protect and prevent these crises. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ma uh, Max, for that, uh, for that contribution um, and raising some really important kind of broader points for us to think about uh, going forward. Um, and you mentioned in your contribution uh, about assessment and about exams. And on this call this evening, I think we're really happy to be able to uh, send messages of solidarity and congratulations uh, to many students in Ireland who have successfully campaigned uh, for the cancellation of the Leaving Cert, uh, which is the kind of high stakes test uh, at the end of uh, their school career. Um, and as has been pointed out by a lot of people, uh, during the lockdown, a lot of the inequalities that exist in society have been exacerbated, um, you know, with, uh, with um, many students unable to access uh, the internet and the work that they've been set by their teachers, but also uh, having uh, to, to, to do that work uh, in, in, in housing that is uh, at times overcrowded and too noisy. And so actually the importance of the education system prioritizing uh, the, the health and the well-being of young people as we come out of lockdown needs to be uh, something that's absolutely paramount. But that kind of leads us on really to this question uh, of assessment. And we had a question come in uh, yesterday, even before we uh, started this particular call about assessment. 
and uh, it was a question asking um, now that we are um, now that we're moving um this year to um, a cancellation of exams at GCSE and A level and the SATs, um, what kind of alternative assessments uh, um, should we be calling for uh, going forward? Or is this going to just be uh, a one off, a flash in the pan um, back to high stakes testing this year? I'm going to start with Matt in Seattle because obviously they have the experience uh, of um, of uh, of students being awarded their um you know their a in their exams but it'd be really good to hear from matt about what the kind of mood is amongst ed american educators and students about what kind of assessments uh, we need to see in future um and it is the high stakes standardized te standardized testing market uh, going to be revitalized in 2021 uh, and things go back to normal. So, Matt, can you just talk us through, um, you know, what kind of alternatives, what kind of uh, debates are taking place uh, in the US at the moment? Uh, and then I'm going to go to uh, Sarah on that, maybe to to give us uh, her thoughts as well. Absolutely, yeah. That, thank you for the great question. I think um, there's a uh, there's a lot of discussion about it right now, especially because people can't sit for these tests. Uh, people who are looking to go on to uh, higher education and and don't uh, just have these big question marks over their uh, academic career. So uh, there's a definitely a movement uh, just to to do away with them entirely, um, and that I, I think is uh, the the perspective of a lot of uh, educators who see the real impact of. Of, uh, of just the prep and the time spent on these tests uh, in the classroom. But that's not automatic, right? Just because uh, best practice or the workers uh, in, the, in the position to know see the impacts of these, just like with reopening schools, uh, knowing is not enough, right? We have to organize to make sure uh, we can win that. Uh, and then also uh, keep that victory uh, after COVID. I think the point you raised is uh, important, not just what do we do in the short term. Sure, give everybody an A, say we don't care about the tests this time, um, but education corporations, Pearson, uh, will be will be ready uh, when we go back to COVID uh, to to put that emphasis back uh, on on making sure these tests uh, happen because that's where their profit comes from. So again, it's not just a question of what is correct, um, but also uh, what do we have uh, the strength to win. Thanks, Matt, uh, for that for that contribution. Um, and let's uh, also hear um, from Sarah as well, your thoughts on um, <laughs> assessment going forward. Uh, obviously, it's a real minefield at the moment, but I think it's really important as a profession that we are placing demands uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, on the government in terms of how we reform our education system. So, Sarah. I mean, I, I have to say, I haven't given a lot of thought to, to moving forward, but I can, I can think about it as, as, we're, as we're talking now. But um, definitely what this year's exposed is the level of inequality within the education system. So, for example, you've got top set down to set, set eight or nine in some cases. So students are completely ranked in terms of, I mean, often, it, often the, the way they're ranked reflects their economic situation, to be perfectly honest. Uh, so the top sets are often very, very white, very middle class. The bottom sets are very often BAME, more BAME students, poorer students and so on. The, the really, really horrible thing that's happened this year for us is that um, even though the kids have worked their socks off and they would be awarded, let's say, a level eight, a level nine, whatever it might be, we've done further and we, we were like, OK, they've worked the socks off. We're going to be as honest as we can on a good day, given it would be a great exam, blah, blah, blah. But the government then came back and asked us to rank individual students so let's say we've got five kids who would have got a, a nine as the top grade that they could get we've been asked to rank them in order of who would get the best nine who would get the worst nine and we've actually been asked to rank um all of the students so we've got 200 and odd second uh, year 11s for example the gcse leavers we've been asked to put them in in order i mean it's absolutely it's breaking it's really heartbreaking in the sense that we know that some of these kids would have been awarded a grade but they're probably not going to get it now because in terms of the country doing this it just automatically um, it inputs a, a really a, a really harsh sense of competition across the board. So I think I actually think that by by doing this, that, I mean we we were we were okay with awarding, like you said, given the whatever grade we give, this is fine moving forward. But in terms of how the government are going to utilise this, I think this will actually disadvantage a lot of a lot of working class kids. And uh, and and the other thing it really highlights is the lack of SCND provision. 
So it really, it really exacerbates and shows just how poorly, like the UK is literally not set up to support kids with special needs. It just isn't in terms of autism, in terms of like any kind of literacy input. I mean, it's been cut to the bone as we know, but how that looks coming out of this or within this crisis now is that the inequalities gap is going to be really broadened by the fact that not just the computer access, but the level of literacy that you need to it to to access things and so on. So I think I think in, I mean, in terms of like the imagination for us, the imagination will be looking at, for me, an abolition of setting. So looking at mixed abilities. So it will be for me the uh, tiny classes. I mean, in some senses, social distancing might be good. We'll have classes of five or six, maybe like private schools. Who knows? But it'd be it would be really positive to see um, smaller classes, a, a reasserting of SEND special needs support support for children whose language is not English as their first language and so on because we we, we really need to, going forward to, to 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 close the gap to, you know enable all our kids to be more successful and I think it just highlights how we're how we're um what's the word kind of what's the word I can't think of the word I need but the, the idea that at the moment that you know the, the middle class kids are successful and the working class kids are not successful and that really has to change That's brilliant. Thanks very much, Sarah, for, for that contribution. I think also, uh, as a teacher who works in a department where we've just moved from setting to mixed ability this year, um, I was uh, I was uh, punching the air when you were talking about uh, the the abolition of setting. That actually this crisis has uh, you know has has posed really important questions, uh, not just uh, specific to uh, COVID nineteen, but actually really important questions about how our uh, education system. Uh, is structured in general and one of the themes of a lot of what people have talked about is about the impact of austerity uh, on the education system but we've also seen that uh, in other public services as well so i'm going to um, going to go to michael now really just to talk uh, talk us through uh, about the impact of austerity uh, in uh, in your college michael but also you know where have you seen the impact of cuts uh, in other public services uh, related to education and you know what can be done about that you know what what has happened what's what's happened in leicester in the past uh and what what needs to happen going forward to ensure that we have fully funded uh, public services that can actually serve the needs uh, of their communities michael well, yeah thanks for that question uh, i think uh i mean in, it's just in my own workplace so i'm actually a science technician uh support mostly a level and btech so i provide the get equipment ready for students to do in practicals but uh, we're just seeing that, I mean, I, I watch what teachers do in every day, but there's so much pressure just to teach, 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 so that you can get through the curriculum because you have more, you know, less and less time to teach the same curriculum, yet students have still got to understand very difficult concepts. And so things like practicals, which are a very important part of doing science, like the science is how we're going to get our way out of, part of how we're going to get our, our way out of this crisis, uh, are totally being undermined because there's not enough emphasis on actually doing things and learning practical skills and having time to connect theory to you know hands-on work but like just across the whole education sector there's just a massive like the first people to be cut always education uh, uh, support workers like you have massive cuts all across the board and in some instances unions have been able to uh, fight back and unite workers I mean, it's when that happens, that's when you can push back against uh, either it's local management or local authorities who, who just think, well, teachers can't cut teachers, although they are, but we can cut uh, support workers because they're not needed. So in one instance, uh, I think it was about 10 years ago in Leicester, there was a primary school had a high number of, uh, like a very high ratio of support workers to students because there's a lot of students with uh, like big special needs, a lot of foreign languages. And the management at the uh, workplace just said, no, uh, support workers have no value added input, don't do anything to improve the lives of students. I mean, and every teacher and every student and every parent, everyone knew that was utter rubbish. And it resulted in a big strike and it did force back management because of that. And they had to drop their initial plans. But I mean, in the context of years and years of austerity, things do get cut and services are cut. and I think one of the big campaigns that I was involved with uh, so for quite a long time ago, though, is uh, about cuts to old people's homes. Like, you know, they were all privatised uh, over the last few decades. 
And as a result of the privatisation, it's like a vital public service where we keep elderly people. Uh, and a lot of, I mean, and that has multiple impacts because one, people can't necessarily afford to put their parents and vulnerable people in care homes. So they have to live in close proximity to children. And with coronavirus, that means they've been exposed to it. But also the care homes themselves are being taken over by huge corporations where the only thing they really care about, and it's the same with academization. So for example, my school was academized this year uh, during lockdown, in fact, it, the, final, the final part of it went through. Uh, and academization is not about improving education, it's about privatization of education. Uh, and so because of that ongoing privatization of uh, care homes, it means you have huge mega care homes so the average care home size used to care for about 20 elderly people. Now the average in the corporate sector is around 60. And that means that when you have a crisis, not only are they understaffed, but it means that something like coronavirus can rip through a whole care home and kill everybody. And so in other countries, like uh, I think it was Norway, they have a much, much smaller care homes. And so it's been far less disruptive. And so, I mean, you could pick almost anything and talk about it, like everything's been destroyed. Yeah. It's terrible. Thanks, Michael. And obviously, um, you know, the 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 program of austerity that the uh, Tories uh, have unleashed on the population for the last decade um, posed the importance of us organising and fighting back, but also uh, it poses the importance of um, political organisation. And you're listening to the call this evening um, which is hosted by Socialist Alternative. And if you're interested in finding out more uh, about Socialist Alternative, join in Socialist Alternative, uh, then somebody's going to put uh, some details and contact details into the chat section uh, of the Facebook Live in a moment um, where you can uh, go, go to the website uh, or request more information uh, about the uh, about Socialist Alternative uh, and join uh, this evening. So. Um, before, uh, a few things uh, that, that Michael said and also Matt touched on in his contribution, I just want to, uh, I'm going to go to Max in a moment and, and ask about, which is around this whole question of the crisis um, and um, how sections of the ruling class and school management and so on have used it uh, as a way of, um, uh, of, uh, of pushing their particular agenda. And we've had a really good comment from Kamia um, from South Africa in the, uh, in the comment section on the Facebook Live around how some of the NGOs and the not-for-profits uh, not uh, um, linked to the privatisation agenda have been pushing online learning uh, as a substitute. So uh, a question for Max really is, um, going forward, how do we ensure that we don't see COVID-19 being used as cover for de-skilling the profession and for, um, you know, for removing uh, the, the, the skill and the training of a, uh, of a classroom teacher and replacing it with online learning uh, on, and learning effectively on the cheap? So, Max, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's an interesting question, actually. Um, and it's, you know, it, on the one hand, uh, this, the whole sort of distance learning that's been, that's been very quickly forced upon us by the crisis, as ever, has shown the wonderful kind of technological capabilities we have uh, and, under, under capitalism to, to do new things. You know, we've been using uh, various like Google programs to interact with students and do distance learning. So it shows what sort of tools are there. But as you've mentioned, lots of this is now already uh, about to be used by big business um, to try and de-skill the profession, maybe have, you know, teachers become sort of merely classroom behavior managers while some kind of ex you know, supposedly expert teacher teaches from afar. But at the same time, and I think Sarah um, touched on this, you know, the di not everyone can access the distance learning, not only through technological reasons, but through things like, you know, literacy and, and so on, other kinds of the environment that people are in that might not be conducive to, to learning. And it, for me, it's actually shown even more the importance of being in the classroom and the importance of actually that personal interaction and have been able to see the students and what they're doing and understand and see kind of how they're feeling and if they really, really get something, which you can't get at all um, from any kind of uh, online online tool. So I think it's really important that we organise um, and that we make sure that, uh, that we're really clear that we can, I think we should, we should also take a lead in looking at the ways in which the technology that we have 
can be used to sort of augment what we're already doing and, and use it in a, in a positive way, um, but also resist those attempts that might be made to, um, to, to make profit out of it or to just uh, turn teachers into people who just manage the classroom without actually uh, being able to use our own professional judgment in, in how we teach. So, yeah. Thanks very much, Max. Um, before we, we're, we're fast running out of time, but it's a really excellent discussion uh, with a lot of varied and really important uh, comments. Um, and the chat section of the uh, of the Facebook Live uh, has had a, a number of different uh, discussions going on. Um, one of the points that was made about uh, was about the, the the certain lack of political opposition uh, from the new leadership of the Labour Party, which we don't really have time to go into detail uh, on the call this evening. But I'd encourage people to read uh, some of the articles on the Socialist Alternative website that talk about. Uh, you know, the kind of politics of Keir Starmer and what is necessary uh, to build a, a fighting militant opposition that can take on uh, the Tories. But what I want to kind of finish up with really uh, is, a, is a comment that was made in the chat about how do we broaden out this struggle uh, outside of just uh, the, you know, the immediate education community to broaden out those links uh, into, into the wider community. I'm going to hopefully hear um, just maybe a, just a you know a minute or two from all of the speakers on this one because it's an important question um, because coming out of COVID nineteen um, you know it's I think there's a kind of general consensus that going back to to business is, is normal is a not possible uh, but certainly not desired as well and actually what we need is a movement uh, to be able to uh, to uh, to change society but a movement uh, requires building. Uh, building uh, those alliances and building those links. So um, I'm, just, I'm going to go to Matt in Seattle, first of all, just to talk about how some of the uh, um, American education unions have been able to make those links with the community and other organisations. And then maybe hear just one minute from each of the speakers uh, about what they've seen uh, in their local communities and what we need to be doing going forward. So Matt, first of all, if you could just give us a little bit of an insight uh, from Seattle. Absolutely. Um, so I, you know, it's been brought up a bunch of times already on the call. Uh, I, Max was just talking about it with regards to the need to organize. Uh, I, I mean, that's, that's the lesson, organize. Um, really just quickly as like what that looks like. Um, I think it's really important, uh, going back to something Michael said a bit earlier um, about how we need to organize across union and a, a, across uh, not just uh, sector within the, the building, right? Not just all of the different uh, people uh, who work in, in a school building, um, but, but sectors of the economy. And a lesson just in the 30 seconds here uh, is from West Virginia. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get more time to talk about it, but the heroic fights uh, of, of, non, of, of educators who are in uh, extremely uh, anti-union territory, uh, who when, when educators in West Virginia uh, fought in all 55 counties of the state uh, for, to defend public education, it wasn't the teachers. It was not uh, just classroom educators uh, who stood up. They said, we are not going to go on strike until we get a vote of everybody in the building, uh, from the custodian to the, uh, the people who work in the cafeteria, uh, to all of the, the parent educators educators, uh, even though a lot of those aren't represented uh, by the education union, uh, if they're represented by a union at all. Um, so that lesson of what we call uh, in the American labor movement, wall-to-wall -wall organizing, uh, learning that it's not just the question of who is in my union or in my um, immediate uh, shared interests, uh, but it's interest in the interest of all of us to work across uh, unionized and non-unionized layers uh, and all of the sectors and all of the uh, layers within, within the school. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Matt. Before I go to Sarah, um, you know, we, we are entering a really, really important period now um, that, uh, for, for all trade unionists, students, their families, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the announcements that we're expecting in the next few weeks. Um, I've, I've made the appeal to join Socialist Alternative, but also if you're watching this call, you work in the education sector, or to be honest, if you work uh, anywhere and you're not a member of a trade union it's, it's really imperative you do that as well uh, but in the national education union socialist alternative supports uh, uh, an organization called education solidarity network you can go onto facebook uh, 
uh, and find the Facebook page for Education Solidarity Network or ESN. Um, follow that page because over the next few days there will be important content going up there uh, that will help guide uh, uh, guide reps and members uh, and so on uh, in terms of how we respond to this crisis as it moves incredibly quickly. Um, but really we're going to hear just a last few remarks. Um, we're going to begin with uh, Sarah um, to talk to us about how, how in Hackney uh, they have been broadening it out to the community, how we can broaden it out further uh, to ensure uh, that we win. Sarah. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So, I mean, one, one, one thing that's really startling about Hackney that we found out last week was that we've got the third highest death rate in the country. Uh, and when you look at the, the ONS report on this, they, they, they attribute the biggest cause of death is homes of multiple occupancy. So one of the, one of the angles coming out of this for us, I, I live on an estate, and we've been petitioning, campaigning for council housing for a long time. But one of the one of the clear outcomes of this is that we need council housing. We need we need to have housing that's adequate, that's fit for families, that's fit for purpose. So that's that's one angle um, that we'd be looking at. The other thing that I think is worth to mention is just within days of the of the outbreak, my son and people on the estate put these posters up. So he's part. He's become part of this COVID nineteen support group, mutual aid thing. And people have been incredible. So it's not just the clapping for carers, but the fact that on our, on my estate, everyone signed the petition for the parents, you know, the parents, their workers. One of my neighbours is an ambulance driver, paramedic. So uh, the, my next door neighbour is a nurse. So you've got all these, we, we think of people in a way like they're just people, but they're workers too. They've got kids too. They've got the same concerns as us. So what's really amazing is we've built a very, very supportive network within the estate. And the conversations might be now, what union are you in, not just how are you or, you know, how's your day going? People are actually talking about the positions their unions are taking a little bit more. So I think, I think that's really optimistic and I think that gives us a lot of strength in a way. That's, that's great, Sarah. And I think um, you raise a really important point about how people's consciousness is changing during this crisis and, you know, kind of uh, how people are looking at the situation, what they're talking about, and maybe Michael and Max, when they comment can maybe give a few examples uh, of how that has changed as well before i bring michael in we had a really excellent comment in the facebook uh, discussion around physical distancing that we've not had time to deal with uh, and particularly in relation to um to um primary uh, students uh, and carly of course was on the call at the beginning she's had to leave the call uh, she's she's a primary practitioner and it would have obviously been great to hear from her um, because we you know what we're hearing really is in terms of physical distancing uh, is you know it's nigh on impossible not only in the secondary sector uh, and even possibly in you know in in further education but certainly in uh, primary and the need for a really serious detailed plan of physical distancing before we can go back is is absolutely paramount and that doesn't seem to be in place yet um, so we've got a, a little bit of time just to hear from Michael and Max uh, and then we're going to wrap things up so um, it would be good to hear from Michael and Max, uh, obviously about uh, the kind of wider links to the community, but also how, about how people's thinking has changed during this crisis um, and how we might see things developing uh, in the next few months and years politically uh, and industrially in Britain. So I'm going to go to Michael first of all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I think one of this, one of the things that is going to come out of this whole pandemic is that we're not all in this together. There is a ruling class and the world has become more unequal over recent years, over decades, over the last four decades. And increasing wealth is being filtered upwards and away from ordinary people. And this shows that, I mean, we're paying for it with our lives, literally in this country and across the world. And we're living in a country where there's plenty of wealth. I mean, there's plenty of wealth all over the world. It's just siphoned off to the super rich. I mean. One of the most obvious things to do after this crisis is we make the super rich pay the tax they owe us in this country. And if we just did that, that would be £120 billion pound a year. And when you talk about the tiny amounts of money they're throwing at uh, like looking for vaccines and stuff like that, £120 billion, that could come straight back to our communities, could like do the things Sarah said. We could build council houses for everybody. We could have cheap. I mean, we could have brilliant education where you have far fewer teachers. I mean, I think some of the immediate things as well that we'll need to do is, well, we'll need to get very, very well organised. And I think this is showing to people the need to be organised. We need to get rid of the anti-trade union laws that exist in this country, which make it increasingly hard to fight back against the government. 
but I think they'll be overturned. We need to overturn them and call upon the trade union movement to do that, and we'll do that. Uh, we also need to demand that every workplace has the right to negotiate within a trade union with their management, because there's so many key workers in this country don't even have the right to negotiate with their managers as to their paying conditions. So the people being forced into appalling conditions, and these are key workers, the ones I'm thinking of particularly are in food factories, making our food, it's just around the corner. So they have some sites in uh, companies like Greencore where some of the units, the factory units uh, have negotiating rights and others don't. That's absolutely appalling, that has to end. So every trade unionist needs to say, we've got to fight against that in its entirety. And I think really, we can't just do these things individually. We need to link up with one another and build uh, solidarity with people, all socialists across the country and across the world. But we also need uh, working class organizations that are democratic and are big enough to take on capitalists. And that might mean, I mean, I have had high hopes for Jeremy Corbyn in the Labour Party, but I'm very, very disappointed uh, with the sort of, sort of the Blairite seizure of control again of the Labour Party apparatus. And so I think we need to think seriously about how we go forward. We need to have a political representation in Parliament. We need people who are going to fight for us alongside trade unionists so we can change society together. I mean, I think the one thing we can learn from this, and we've seen it with the whole uh, coronavirus already, when there's been unsafe workplaces, when workers walk out collectively, then all of a sudden management find the PPE for them. They just find it. So I think that's one of the things a lot of workers are going to be learning from this whole crisis, is that when they stand together, they can win. Thanks, Michael. Um, Max, you've got the last words uh, on everything. You've got about a minute uh, to get through uh, all of that before we wrap things up. Thanks, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to say too much. I mean, one of the things at our school, one of the reasons why teachers were concerned about the school closure was because we know there's lots of uh, parents of our students who are in precarious employment, you know, on zero hours contracts. Um, so I think one really important thing is to make sure that we can reach out and, and you know, unionise and organise those kinds of workers as well, because you know, the, the very fact we have students that uh, are in need of free school meals is an indictment of the kind of system that we have in, in the first place. Um, but also, I think, uh, you know, in terms of union activity, before the crisis, when lots of people would ask about, you know, ask each other about why be a member of the union, a lot of the time it's like, oh, you get legal advice or, or protection in, you know, if something you get... Uh, allegations made against or something like that but now during and after the crisis it's really clear what the need of a union is you know it's really clear that uh, uh, unions are needed actively nationally and in every workplace in order to protect the interests of of uh, of teachers uh, educators and of the community more widely so i think it's made the need for a union really really clear and i think that's a uh, change in the minds of lots of workers uh, and will do uh, over the next period Thanks, Max. I think that's a really important note to, to end on. Uh, and that kind of leads me to uh, thank all of our speakers. Uh, Matt joining us uh, from Seattle, uh, to Sarah from Hackney and Carly as well, uh, Michael from Leicester and uh, Maxstrom uh, Lambeth. And I really hope, I mean, one of the great things about uh, one of, well, one of the positives that's come out of this crisis for all of the stress and the strain, the difficulty, uh, is it's actually forced uh, all of us to to, to reconsider, reevaluate uh, the world that we live in, to get together and discuss in forums like this uh, about how we uh, take things forward. And we hope that those discussions continue. We hope that people who've watched this this evening uh, continue to, to to communicate with us, to interact with us, to talk to each other, um, because we've got a lot of really really important. Uh, we've got really important questions that we need to grapple with uh, and, and we need to get organised. So it leaves me really just to say uh, that I hope everyone stays uh, safe, that you stay healthy, but also get organised because uh, we've got some really important work to do. Uh, but if we unite and if we uh, fight together, uh, then we can win. So thank you very much for joining us uh, and good evening. Enjoy the rest uh, of your weekend.